How hops at Majestic Magpies? Welcome to Vignettes and Vigilantes, a podcast about films in the DC animated universe. I am your host, RK Muse, and today we will be reviewing California, directed by Dominic Senna and starring a very greasy Brad Pitt. California is a serial killer thriller following an aspiring crime writer and his photographer girlfriend who pick up two shifty characters while driving to California to start a new life. The shifty characters are an unhinged murderer and his childlike girlfriend. This is a bloody, brutal, and emotionally draining movie with amazing performances from our four principal actors. The film opens up on a dark and stormy night, and to borrow a title card from Frasier, no, Really. It is a dark and stormy night. A young woman walking the streets gets into a car with a creepily grinning man. A different man, not in the car, is shown grabbing a mud-soaked rock. As the woman asks the driver for a cigarette light, the rock comes slamming into the windshield. The car rolls onto its side as the rock thrower stands at the overpass, staring soullessly as the driver comes crawling out of the car, quickly dying, the car's cigarette lighter still in his hand. The man at the overpass is a greasy, redneck version of Brad Pitt, who is later identified as Early Grace. Narration from Fox Mulder begins describing how this man does not seem to care much about human life. Fox Mulder himself is actually a writer named Brian Kessler, and he is debating the perception of serial killers with a friend. He believes that psychopathic killers should be understood rather than reviled. Brian is joined by his girlfriend, Carrie Laughlin, who is a photographer with some specialization in erotica. Ooh la la. She is also sporting an extremely short hairdo, which stops just at her ears. It comes back in a big way, so remember that. At the same time, Early enters a diner, asks the waitress for a bowl of chili, and begins taunting a squirming cockroach, flicking it onto the stove across from the counter. Gross. Brian and Carrie are then seen prowling around an abandoned lot, which was apparently the site of a murder. Brian, who also narrates the film, mentions that he had written magazine articles, which got him an advance to write a book exploring the pathology of serial killers. Brian says that he's been smacked in the face with the crowbar that is writer's block, a struggle I can relate to entirely. Meanwhile, back at the diner, the waitress who took Early's order comes out and finds a pair of red shoes in one of the booths. It was a gift from Early because the waitress, Adele Corners, is his girlfriend. Adele has a childlike mind as she gushes over the high heels and compares them to Cinderella slippers. Brian and Carrie return home from their field trip and engage in coitus. They live in a nice urban apartment that looks like a perfect studio. Carrie is shown to be the sexually forward one in the relationship, encouraging Brian to remove his shirt before he can even think of doing so. This will also come back in a way. Now let's recap. Carrie has very short hair, she works as a photographer, and she's sexually forward. Just remember those three things about her character and you're good to go. Early and Adele contradictorily live in a run-down trailer park with barking dogs and a shit ton of tetanus-causing rust. Brian and Carrie are sitting at home with Carrie observing her sexually explicit pictures. The gallery she does freelance for is not a fan of her explicit content. She is extremely depressed by being rejected, and can anyone blame her? She is also looking for a change, moving to California, a place where the artists go in droves. This sparks an idea in Brian who decides they might as well take the chance. Their idea is that if they go to California, they have a better chance of making their dreams come true. Early comes home from work just then and finds his parole officer exploring the sty that is the trailer. The parole officer has a pair of mutton chops, a hook for a hand, and a nasty Walter White cough, and he also does not tolerate bullshit. He basically intimates that Early just likes to blame everyone for his problems, with the exception of God. Early thinks he and God are good. The parole officer tells Early to find himself a good job and report back with his findings, which I think is customary for parolees to do. The parole officer likes to bust Early's balls, but I guess you have to be tough when you're dealing with someone as aggressive and foul-mouthed as Early Grace. Back in the studio, Brian is writing down his ideas for his novel when he is joined by a tired and dejected Carrie. He has been using her pictures and his recorded tapes to help with the writing process. He says that this inspiration has helped him understand what was going on in the warehouse murderer's head. He wants to explore the different murder sites across the country while they make their way to California, driving through various southern states. Meanwhile, at the trailer park, Early is harangued by his landlord, he who owns the barking dogs. But the landlord is only haranguing Early since Early is behind on his rent, as well as driving recklessly and assholishly. Adele notices this and begins to laugh, but not because she finds the landlord's troubles amusing, but because his two barking dogs are now humping each other. Honestly, same girl, I always laugh at humping dogs. At the college where Brian is a graduate student, he tacks an index card advertising a rideshare to a communal bulletin board. Another student argues that no one would want to split expenses and drive across the country. Brian shrugs off her skepticism and leaves. The student is then approached by Early, who gets all the way up in her face, and asks about the personnel office. She points it out to him and then GTFOs, leading to him calling her the B-word. Yikes. But Early does notice the rideshare advertisement, which piques his curiosity. 
That night, Adele calls to Early, who is digging a large hole. This also gives Mr. Brad Pitt the opportunity to show off his cut-as-a-diamond, yet also slender physique. Adele asks Early to tell her about California. He proceeds to tell her that people think faster because of the warm weather, you never have to buy any fruit because it's always hanging on trees, and the state law is that the first month's rent is free. I'm not sure if that's true. Any Californians care to drop some knowledge? Early also tells Adele that they'll climb the Hollywood sign with beer and howl at the moon. Early then tells Adele to go on and get, since he still has that massive hole to dig. Later on, we get to see a naked Brad Pitt emerging from the hole, only of the backside ladies, as the scene transitions to a brand new day. Brian and Carrie are leaving their apartment, bags packed, dressed in black leather. Brian is amused and flattered that Early called him Sir the entire time he was being interviewed. Carrie hopes that Early and Adele will be more interesting than Brian's friends, who apparently only like to talk serial killers. Adele is at the depot waiting on Early, talking to herself and holding a canvas bag with her baby cactus Lucy inside. She is nervous about leaving the state as his parole forbids such a thing. As Brian and Carrie approach them in the car, Carrie remarks they look like Okies, while Adele tells Early that the other couple looks weird. Brian is just plain friendly, though, and introduces himself to Early and Adele, helping the latter with her bags. Adele eagerly introduces herself to Carrie, who is cool as a cucumber. Adele says she likes Carrie's hair because it's short, and though Early says nothing to Carrie, he does shoot her a glance in the side view mirror. As they drive away, the camera pans on Lucy lying in the trash can. As they start driving, Brian makes conversation, with Early revealing that he used to work in a mirror factory. Adele says that Early had several hundred years of bad luck because of breaking mirrors in the factory. Carrie mentions the concept of karma, which flies right over Adele's head. Back at the trailer park, Early's coughing parole officer is surveying a burning mess taken care of by firefighters. The officer on site says that it's an arson job, and the parole officer says Early was talking about moving to Texas. The cop asks about the landlord, but then the firefighters call out, having found the landlord murdered. Brian's narration reveals that Early was wearing the landlord's ring, and then speculates about what happened to the landlord's finger. At a pit stop, Early purchases a camera for Adele and tacks on a Virgin Mary statue to the dashboard. In his words, just in case. He may be religious, but considering the fact that he brutally murdered a man, I don't think he's even that close to being considered a true holy person. The first stop on the murder tour is exploring the Novak family farm, which seems perfectly idyllic with the white picket fence and the cute little house. But Brian reveals that the Novak family had accepted a drifter into their home. After coming up dry on work for the drifter, the Novaks asked him to leave, and in response, he murdered the entire family, including the nine-year-old daughter. Swell guy. Carrie tries taking pictures of the estate, but keeps getting photobombed by an ominous-looking Early. Brian and Carrie meet the new owners of the Novak home, while Early eases an unlocked window open and steals a purse. Later that night, they convene at a hotel. While having Din Din, Early removes his tattered sock and rubs his foot, right at the table and right next to a stunned Carrie. Personally, I don't think she's being unreasonable, but Brian definitely thinks she's acting snotty when she complains to him in their own room. Brian argues that Early can't help being that way because it was how he was raised. Meanwhile, Early is bitching about the $30 a night stay for a motel, and Adele sings to herself. Back in Brian and Carrie's room, she is convinced they're nearly broke and she does not want to pick up the slack. Brian distracts her with sexy times and they begin having some sex against the wall, which allows us to see Fox Mulder's butt. A lot of fan service in this movie, both of her people attracted to men and to women. As Brian and Carrie begin having raucous intercourse, we see Early leaned against the wall, listening intently. Creepy. The next morning, they meet for the morning meal. Not that Early and Adele take part, since Early does not believe in the eating of breakfast. Adele pops by with hair just as short as Carrie's, much to Carrie's shock, especially when Early says that Adele looks prettier with short hair. Brian compliments Adele's hatchet job, and it becomes abundantly clear that Adele does everything Early asks of her. Carrie's creep meter is going absolutely haywire, and I feel the same way. As the quartet stop for gas, Early stands in the middle of the road, causing a driver to honk at him. Nobody likes being honked at, but Early takes it a step too far when he corners the man in the bathroom and stabs him to death. The man was draining his catheter at the time when Early stabs him. Meanwhile, Adele tells a chain-smoking Carrie that she used to smoke and that Early helped her break that habit because he thinks women should not smoke, drink, or swear. Adele tells Carrie that she spells her curse words instead. Brian goes to wash up in the bathroom, but Early gets him to change his mind by claiming he took a wicked shit. Polly Walnuts has got nothing on Early when it comes to wicked shits. The foursome drive on forward, and it seems as though Carrie is softening towards Adele. Not towards Early, of course, but she and Adele are playing card games like old pals, while Brian and Early discuss the never-discovered Black Dahlia killer. 
Early likes Brian's theories of the Black Dahlia killer being a serial murderer, and he probably likes that theory because it validates his own feelings. He thinks the Black Dahlia killer is old and reliving his memories of serial murder over and over. As they stop at a motel that night, Brian and Carrie share a nice kiss before Brian and Early head out for the night. Carrie and Adele begin chatting, and Carrie asks how the two of them met. Adele was hitchhiking and was immediately taken with Early's serious face. She says she was charmed by his angelic eyes and she went to live with him in his trailer. Adele proposes they all live in a house together in California, and Carrie has that awkward moment where she doesn't really want to commit to anything because she's got other plans. Carrie offers to straighten up Adele's hair, and Adele admits that she doesn't like having short hair. While fixing her hairdo, Carrie learns straight from Adele that she had been brutally gang-raped as a teenager and that she had regressed to a childlike state, which explains a lot of her naivete as well as her idealistic outlook. She says that she feels safe with Early because he treats her nice most of the time. She also says that he'd never let her be attacked like that. This saddens Carrie, but Adele fawns over her improved haircut, saying it looks professional. Early and Brian have headed to a pool hall, and a low-class biker begins giving Brian trouble. Early indulges his psychopathic tendencies and administers a beating to the biker. This stuns Brian, who's clearly not used to seeing so much violence at the drop of a hat. Carrie and Adele are still chatting, and Adele mentions that her mother worked as a beautician and was very disappointed that Adele shacked up with Early. Adele also lets it slip to Carrie that Early was jailed for resisting arrest and carrying a gun. Adele leaves and feels immense guilt for drinking with Carrie. As Brian and Early are leaving the pool hall, an inebriated Brian begins acting as raucous and obnoxious as Early, just minus the sadism. Honestly, not a great influence. Brian comes home to find Carrie smoking and looking cross, but also thoughtful. Brian reveals that he was drinking with Early. Carrie says they have to talk about Early. She was particularly incensed by Early beating Adele for myriad reasons, including drinking and, in her words, only when Adele deserves it. Early also gives conflicting information. He told Adele he was jailed for carrying a gun, while he told Brian that he stole a car. Carrie is livid by Brian defending Early, and these aren't thoughts that go away from a good night's sleep. The following morning, Brian is horribly hungover, but Early is unbothered by the night of drinking. As they're driving on, Adele pulls out a brand new cactus out of her backpack, calling this one Shelly. As Brian, still hungover, looks over his shoulder, he spots a gun in Early's luggage. Not a good sign. At the next stop on the murder tour, Early is shooting out windows with the aforementioned gun and gets Brian in on it. Adele is excited by the show of marksmanship, but Carrie is sickened. Now, enjoying shooting guns does not mean you're a psychopath, but considering Early's growing influence on Brian and Carrie's revulsion at the mere thought of Early, it's easy to see why she's so terrified. Early, oblivious to Carrie's discomfort, tells Brian to keep the gun, reasoning that he can get another one down the line. While exploring another murder house on the murder tour, Brian plays a recording of a young woman being murdered. Carrie, who's completely unnerved at this point, begins taking pictures, but eventually stops near tears. She is disturbed by the tape and even more disturbed by how Brian is becoming mesmerized and enchanted by Early. She argues that just one week ago, Brian would have never shot a gun as wildly as he did. Brian says that firing off a gun was just a cheap thrill. Carrie can't believe she agreed to take murder photos, and Brian argues that she was always gung-ho about the project. Carrie counters that she just wanted to get Brian motivated so they could get to California. As she angrily leaves, she spies Early and Adele having amped up sex in Brian's car. She tries to covertly photograph them, but Early notices and is not at all intimidated by the prospect of a voyeur. Seems pretty obnoxious to have sex in someone else's car, but I think Early Grace has devolved from the need of social graces. Pun intended. Carrie runs into Brian and tells him that at the next rest stop, it's either Early that leaves or Carrie herself. With the rain pouring down later that night, Carrie is paying for gas and makes small talk with the attendant. Adele goes into the station to use the bathroom, leaving Brian alone with Early. A television report is piping through the speakers, announcing a manhunt for Early. Early forces his way into the station and steals the shotgun hidden under the counter of the gas station. As the attendant comes back in, Early holds him at gunpoint and asks him his name, which is Walter. Walter does not grovel or cry, but his steely bravery does not keep him from Early's unfair actions. He shoots Walter in the head, beginning a rather brutal and emotionally draining crime spree that takes up the last third of this movie. And by emotionally draining, I mean emotionally draining. It's a hard movie to watch unless you're in the mood for a serial killer thriller or a spree mur murder movie. 
The anguish expressed by Brian and Carrie is particularly heartbreaking, and I can't help but feel worse for Carrie. She was the one who witnessed Early murdering Walter, and she was the one who was always anti-Early. It goes to show that you should always trust your instincts. If you don't feel comfortable with the rideshare agreement, don't go. Unfortunately, it's too late for Brian and Carrie to turn back since they're now Early's hostages. Adele is also Early's accomplice, but she refuses to believe that Early would unjustly take another person's life. As they drive on the following morning, Adele notices the mood has taken a depressing turn. She wants to take pictures of Carrie, who is not in a smiling mood. Adele tells Carrie that Walter, the gas station attendant, was still breathing when they left, but Carrie knows that's nonsense. They drive to an abandoned mine, and Adele is ordered to watch Carrie while Early and Brian take pictures. Early tells Carrie that if she takes off, he'll kill Brian. Poor Carrie, man. She's been put through the ringer and didn't do anything wrong. Adele and Carrie stand outside the car, Adele yo-yoing and Carrie looking around for any path of escape. But considering they're stuck in the mountain as part of Nevada, there's no real path to safety. As Brian and Early converse, Early takes pictures and umbrage with Brian, insinuating that he became a killer because of his mean old abusive dad. Abusive parents seem to be the oldest excuse in the book for serial killers, and I find it an interesting take that Early finds it utter hogwash that, he, that having a physically abusive father is why he became a killer. He doesn't wallow or blame. He accepts the fact that he's a sadistic murderer. He'll probably be more upset about running out of film than anything else. Carrie tries to get Adele to change her mind about Early, but then the police arrive and hold the two of them at gunpoint, only for the first cop to be shot by Early from a distance. Early rushes the other cop, wildly shooting and killing her in the process. The first cop is horribly injured, and although backup has been dispatched, it's clear that help will not be coming anytime soon. Early decides to force Brian to kill the injured cop, saying it would be like a mercy kill, but it's clear Early is just interested in psychological torture rather than caring about goodwill. But Brian refuses to kill the cop, leaving Early to get it done. He even takes a picture with Adele's garish camera. As Early drives on, he chastises Adele for not thanking him for killing the cops and saving her from being shot. Carrie argues that would not have been the case and begins shouting at Early, who responds in kind and then has the nerve to call her, Brian, and Adele crazy. Yeah, sure, asshole. They eventually come up to a little house in the canyon, inhabited by a crap ton of cacti. Adele prattles on about cactuses while Brian, handcuffed to the steering wheel, tries to appeal to her sense of humanity. Early, having used Carrie to get into the house, then begins terrorizing the woman who lives there, who claims she's a widow. Her name is Peaches, and Early finds out about this after sneaking up on her husband in his study. He murders Peaches' husband, Hank, and then gloats about it to Peaches, proclaiming that she is indeed a widow now. Mercifully, though, the act is off screen, but we do get to see Early wielding a golf club. Life sucks for Peaches right now, a kind old woman who did nothing wrong. She, of course, passes out from shock. While Brian and Carrie are handcuffed to the baby grand piano, Early is pouring over Carrie's photography, which has been shown throughout the film depicting extremely sexual positions. Early is thoroughly bored and unimpressed by her work. Adele watches over an unconscious Peaches and can't stop crying, especially as she morosely plays with the numerous cactus knickknacks. When Peaches comes to, Adele promises she won't die as long as she keeps quiet. Carrie distracts Early by saying the model in the nude pictures are her, while Adele whisks Peaches away. She allows Peaches to escape through the back, while Early goes on to tell Brian that he needs to control his woman. Early goes to check on Adele and finds her with the back door open. Peach is nowhere to be found. Adele is also beside herself, seeing it as a clear betrayal to her horrible boyfriend, but she stands up to him and hits him in the head with a potted cactus. Brian decides to lift the piano, telling Carrie to slide her hands out from under the instrument. Adele then tells Early that he's mean and that she doesn't want to hurt anyone with him. Brian's plan has worked and he encourages Carrie to run for it, but Carrie refuses to leave Brian behind. Early comes back and Carrie shouts for Adele to escape. Early begins having a freakout and decides now is as good a time as any to kill Brian so he can have Carrie all to himself. Carrie tells Early she'll do anything, including going with him, if he spares Brian. Early pistol whips Brian and then makes off with Carrie. The next morning, Carrie, clad in one of Adele's baby doll halter tops, is primped by Early and taken away from Peaches' property, and we see Adele murdered in the Garden of Cactuses. Another off-screen death, but I think seeing Early murder Adele would have been particularly heartbreaking for the audience. She was not complicit. She was a mentally ill woman who was fed a bucket of lies and mistreated for years. Early is far from a charmer, and when Carrie smokes to take the edge off, he snatches the cigarette from her. Meanwhile, Peaches is in the living room and is relieved to find that Brian is not dead, just wounded. Props to Peaches for going back to check on the two people who were being held hostage by Early. 
Anyway, she helps him slide out from under the piano again. Brian really stepped the fuck up. He was able to lift a baby grand twice, and although Peaches did not have any handcuff keys nearby, she and Hank were not kinky in that way, Brian manages to maneuver his hands and drive an old truck to follow Early and Carrie, who are now squatting in a nuclear testing site in the desert. Early threatens the dummies inside the testing site. Yeah, sure, buddy. I'm sure they would, you know, fight you or whatever. And then takes Carrie to another room in the splintering house. Brian speeds his way into the site, but gets a little carried away. The truck he's driving soars off the shoulder and crashes into another parked car. It's a minor miracle Brian isn't paralyzed or dead, but there is not any anticlimactic death in store for him. But Early is not making a resolution easy. He has posed the mannequins in sexual positions and is eyeing Carrie with nothing but cold cruelty and putrid lust. He gets up and advances toward her. He pulls her up and gropes her chest and butt. But Carrie stabs him in the stomach with a shard of broken glass. He smacks her in the face, but she manages to run off, hiding in an old bedroom, only for him to corner her and knock her onto the bed. He chastises her like a dog who's just peed on the floor, several consecutive no's, before turning her over on her stomach and handcuffing her to the bed frame. The film dissolves and time passes into morning. Early is sleeping in the living area when breaking glass causes him to stir. He investigates and is greeted with blinding sunlight and a smack in the face with a shovel from Brian. Brian tosses the shovel away, electing not to act like Herbert West. He streaks through the house calling for Carrie and finds her silent and horribly bruised. She flinches when he touches her and he extrapolates that Early raped her. He is then attacked by Early, who is hiding in the Clarice Starling danger corners, stabbing and slashing Brian in the process. Brian army crawls his way over to Early's gun, and let me tell you, Early looks fucking scary with his bloody and grease-soaked hair. Early continues to taunt Brian and sings my favorite Leonard Skinner song, Freebird. Brian grabs the gun but is helped by Carrie, who hits Early in the face with the arm of a test dummy mannequin, having dragged herself over, still cuffed to the bed frame. Carrie tells Brian that the handcuff keys are on a chain around Early's neck. Brian approaches a wounded Early, who sputters and gasps. Police sirens are heard in the background, and Early grabs Brian's face in a last-ditch effort to scare us. He gives a sputtering laugh as Brian shoots him to death. Meanwhile, on a Californian beach, a helicopter flies overhead. Carrie is at the water's edge, her hair having grown much longer. Carrie and Brian are living in a beautiful and probably hella expensive beach house, their relationship having survived the horrors of the rideshare from hell. She goes inside, probably having frozen her tail off in the Pacific Ocean. Brian is listening to his own recorded narration about Early and says he felt nothing when he looked into Early's eyes. He muses that anyone can take a human life, but the monsters don't feel remorse or guilt. Brian listens to his various tapes, which is probably not the greatest form of therapy, but what are you going to do? Carrie finds Brian inside and tells him that an art gallery was extremely interested in her work. Brian proposes they go out to celebrate, leaving behind the still-running tape that includes Adele gushing about their friendship and thanking Brian and Carrie for taking her and Early along. She also hopes that Brian and Carrie won't forget about them when they get to California. And it's glaringly obvious that they'll never quite forget about what happened. And that sums up California. Let's move on to the personal review, shall we? Okay, so remember how I said to remember three certain aspects of Carrie's character? Her short hair, her sexual freedom, and her photography? Well, we're going to discuss those elements in relation to the movie as a whole, so I'm glad you've been paying attention. Let's start the lecture. I, I mean the review. Early Grace can be recognized through sadistic murder and a weird predatory view of women. The way he treats Adele tells us that he preyed on a young woman who had survived a horrific experience, which had caused her to slip into a childlike state. Adele, a rape survivor, had regressed to a childlike mind, and while she and Early still have a sexual component to their relationship, one can imply that he is a frustrated person who likes to control others. Controlling every aspect of Adele's life is what gets him off. He yells at her more like a parent than a lover, and he talks to her in a similarly condescending tone. He assumes that same condescending tone when Carrie fights him off. He scolds her like a puppy or who is just pissed on the floor. Early is possessive and cruel, but he's also savvy and manipulative. He can make Adele love him unconditionally, and he tries forcing Adele's characteristics onto Carrie. And when Carrie bristles, he becomes aggressive. Just a theory, but I believe Early is intimidated by a sexually free and confident woman, which is the polar opposite of his sweet juvenile girlfriend. He takes advantage of how timid Adele is due to the trauma she felt at her rape, and feels frustrated that he can't easily take advantage of Carrie in a similar fashion, because she's more casual about sex. Early cuts Adele's hair so that it resembles Carrie's, which is entirely possible because Adele's hair is much longer and it's easier to cut long hair than to wish short hair to grow. This also sets off a few warning bells for Carrie, who can see that Early is becoming obsessed with her. 
One point I love to bring up about this movie is how Carrie and Adele are perfect foils. Carrie is the womanly figure in this movie, as opposed to Adele's girlish archetype. Carrie is eager to have sex and seems to initiate everything between her and Brian. Adele worships the ground early walks on and is fine with letting him call all the shots. And when it comes to the dynamic between the two couples, Brian never polices Carrie until she starts egging on early while the two are being held against her, their will. Then she, he's definitely telling her to shut up. That conflict had nothing to do with their relationship, but rather an effort for survival. On the flip side, Early controls every part of Adele's life. He bans her from smoking, drinking, and swearing. He won't even let her have breakfast just because he himself doesn't believe in it. He resents the fact that he can't control Carrie in the way he controls Adele, so he uses sex, one of the things she's free and liberal with, to break her towards the end of the movie. But I don't think he succeeded in breaking her. Carrie is quiet, trembling, and traumatized, but that is entirely normal of a person who's been through a traumatic experience. She is also able to help Brian subdue early, showing that she is not too far gone. She and Brian are able to resume their relationship, and though we don't get to see the struggles they went through before the conclusion of the film, we can guess that they fell back into the original roles of their relationship. Brian and Carrie are also in the tortured artist phase, but they are looking to become more successful. Good for them, right? Well, yes and no. Brian and Carrie have creative expression down pat. Carrie is good with a camera, and Brian has myriad ideas he'd like to put down on paper. They work together quite well. Carrie and Brian, at least in my mind, are what would happen if Truman Capote and Annie Leibovitz partnered up. Amazing pictures with poignant writing? Forget about it. But both of their passions become skewered because of their association with Early. Brian's desire to write true crime is mocked and analyzed by Early, who thinks the idea of trying to understand serial killers to be ludicrous. Early physically destroys Carrie's portfolio, and also violates it by sticking his tongue in the paper in a lewd manner. Their art was made dirty because of Early's intrusion. He took their babies, Brian's writing, Carrie's pictures, and stripped them down to useless slips of paper that had no meaning, no creative talent, nothing. He beat them down. The final act of the film involves Brian and Carrie fighting for survival, their motivations for this trip now miles behind them. But the film ends on a positive note. Brian is back to writing, and Carrie's photographs were warmly received and are being presented at a gallery. They were tortured and abused, but they return to their passions and show no signs of slowing down. This film is also extremely atmospheric. It feels hot and grimy and muggy and even dry. Yeah, it basically feels the way Brad Pitt's character looks. The downpour which precedes early kidnapping Brian and Carrie is by far the flashiest part of the movie. The wicked lightning and pounding thunder become nightmarish when early decides to kill Walter who did not deserve his fate in any way, shape, or form. After this occurs, the setting for the rest of the film is either dusk or broad daylight, but when looking at our characters' outfits, we know it's hot as balls. For some reason, when I listen to ACDC, I always feel warmer because I associate that music with the summertime. Don't ask why, but I think one of their albums and hit songs, Highway to Hell, just feels like a summery kind of album, what with that hellish heat. When looking at that perspective from a cinematic angle, California is as much a summer film as Jaws, Jurassic Park, and Sleepaway Camp. California feels hot and cramped and muggy, and as a result, I feel insanely uncomfortable. I hate being hot. I will take winter weather over 95 degree Fahrenheit days any day of the week. I sweat like crazy, I feel more tired, and all I can think about is how greasy my hair is thanks to the sweating. I think seeing the sweat stains on Brad Pitt's outfits and his own greasy hair, it just makes me think of the hottest summers I've ever experienced. Total props. And listen, most films I thoroughly enjoy leave me feeling a certain kind of way. And a lot of times, how I feel about one film overlaps with how I feel about another film. California leaves me with the same tired, hot feeling as the aforementioned summer films, just like how colder movies make me feel the chill of winter, like Frozen Ground, Wind River, and any Christmas film set in a state that actually gets snow in December. When a film makes you feel something external rather than just thoughts and emotion, I think it succeeds at being one hell of an experience. Not all films will make a person feel something on the outside, but California is the ultimate summer film for me. Serial killer movies are a subgenre onto themselves. Serial killer movies tend to be a combination of two or more of these other genres horror, thriller, crime, mystery, noir, etc., etc. But they truly are a subgenre. You can probably name just as many serial killer movies as you can name monster movies or mystery movies. And many serial killers were dramatized for the silver screen. Jeffrey Dahmer, Ted Bundy, Ed Gein, Eileen Warnos, and the Zodiac Killer. But fictional serial killers often draw inspiration from real-life murderers. 
For instance, Francis Dollarhide of Red Dragon was partially based on Dennis Rader, the BTK murderer. Mickey and Mallory Knox of Natural Born Killers, which coincidentally also starred Juliette Lewis, were based on Carol Ann Fugit and Charles Starkweather, a notorious mass murdering couple. Buffalo Bill, my favorite fictional serial killer in cinematic history, was based on Gary Heidnick, Ed Gein, and Edmund Kemper. There are numerous other examples, but serial killers continue to be a dependable trope in fiction because their depravity, cruelty, and sadism are always going to be good traits to have in irredeemable villains. And early Grace deserves to be included on lists of great fictional serial killers. His scowl, his eyes that flip from lecherous to filled with cold hate, and the stench that you can almost smell through the screen, he's a grimy, gross serial killer. I've already more than advocated for this movie as being the ultimate summer heat kind of movie, but about 80% of that grimy, gross heat comes from early in his stained t-shirts, his questionable baseball cap, and the thick, dark strands of hair that made that way through enormous amounts of natural oil. Lastly, the four principal actors play their roles well. This was a role for Brad Pitt that was unexpected at the time. He was a pretty boy with a muscled physique, a charming smile, and appropriately floppy hair. But in California, he's a greasy redneck with a permanent scowl and is progressively more unhinged as the film moves on. Brad Pitt shows off his acting chops, and honestly, I'd love to see more serial killer movies featuring Brad Pitt. He proved that he could act with California, and he continues the trend of badasses with Fike Shit, shit, shit. Forget I mentioned that. I don't like breaking the rules. Anyway, he continues the trend of badasses with Inglorious Bastards, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, Mr. and Mrs. Smith, Killing Them Softly, and Megamind. He's a well-rounded actor, for sure, and I love seeing him play someone as maniacal and evil as Early Grace. Juliette Lewis, similarly, gives the best performance of her life as the mentally delayed and childlike Adele Corners. Adele goes along with her boyfriend's plans because she refuses to recognize the evil that goes on in his head. She'd been raped as a teenager, so the last person she'd want to be with is someone who wants to cause pain and destruction at the expense of others. When it finally clicks with her, she stops ignoring the facts and tells Early that he's just mean in what was undoubtedly the hardest moment of her life that we get to see on the screen. Of course, he murders her right after, but Juliette Lewis played Adele perfectly. You feel bad for her, and you feel upset when you see her body left behind, surrounded by cactuses, the one thing she loved and one of the many things Early took from her, along with her independence, her breakfast preferences, and her hair. You can't overlook our two heroes, either. David Duchovny is always going to be a conspiracy theorist, as far as I'm concerned. Either as the well-groomed and well-spoken Fox Mulder, or as J.P. Pruitt, the disgraced former hand model who gets Derek Zoolander to topple Mugato's manipulative reign. But I really like him as someone who confronts evil. Ryan Kessler has a puppy-dog-eyed look that makes him the perfect foil to the sadistic, predatory early grace. Ryan quickly descending into the same need for survival as early is perfectly acted. Furthermore, Michelle Forbes is phenomenal as Carrie. Once Carrie and Brian meet it early in Adele, there's a trace of what the fuck hidden in her face in every scene. Her emotional distress towards the midpoint of the film is great, too. She's forced to watch the traits her boyfriend picks up from this creepy guy, and she's disgusted by the mere notion that Brian is enjoying his time with Early. Her pleading with Early not to kill Brian is moving, and watching her broken down by Early later on in the movie is particularly terrifying. And for me, that's also the saddest part of the movie. Yet the ending shows her having healed some, and she even carries herself, pun intended, in a different, more cautious, less rough-around-the-edges way. Brilliant acting all around, which results in some great character studies. And that concludes the synopsis and my personal review of California. I will see you in two weeks with a DCAU episode review. Feel free to follow my Instagram page, which is at r.k.musethewriter. I will also upload each of my episodes to my YouTube channel, Vignettes and Vigilantes, so feel free to subscribe. No judgment here. Before you drive across the country to start afresh, make sure your passengers are not sadistic murderers. This has been RK Muse with Vignettes and Vigilantes, flying off with the other magpies.